Good morning, City Light Church. Good morning. My name is Gavin. Go ahead and grab a seat. And welcome, welcome, welcome. This is the Sunday gathering of City Light Church. All throughout the week, we scatter to live on mission in neighborhoods and networks. And on Sunday morning, the day that our Lord rose from the grave, we get together to celebrate that and to sing his praise, to sit under the teaching of his word, to remember his life, death, and resurrection as we take communion. And uh, this morning is an especially exciting morning for us as a church family. Uh, whenever we planted City Light Church, February of 2013, almost six years ago, y'all. It's coming up. We're getting old. We, we, we can only stay young for so long. It's a funny thing about how this calendar works. Still feel like we're new. We're, we're still younger. Um, but we uh, decided to um, uh, come under the umbrella, become a part of a denominational family called the Christian and Missionary Alliance. And so for some of you guys, you're brand new to the church. Uh, some 900 new people have come since February. And uh, this morning is going to be an especially uh, powerful and meaningful time for those of us who are new to get a bigger picture of the movement that we are tied into. So when we planted the church, what originally Originally drew us to the Christian and Missionary Alliance is their heart for missions. Um, since its inception, uh, really um, dating all the way back to the early late 1800s, early 1900s, the DNA that has defined uh, this family of churches has been a shared heart that all the nations of the earth would come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and as King. And so it's been a network of churches that have pooled resources, laborers, prayer, that the nations may be glad. Psalm 67 says, let all the people's praise you let all the nations be glad in God. And that has been the heartbeat of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. And uh, if you're new, every year we have one Sunday where we highlight Alliance missions. And we ask, what is the Lord doing, not just here in Omaha, not just here in the United States, but all over the globe? And how can we be a part of God's greater global mission? And every year we have a missionary to come in and share stories from the field and testimony of what God is doing uh, to encourage us and remind us of what we are a part of. Well, this year, we're especially privileged to have Dr. John Stumbo come and share with us. Uh, Dr. Stumbo is actually the president of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. So I'm not sure how exactly it works, but I think that means he's like my boss's 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 boss or something like that. So please be on your best behavior as Reverend Stumbo preaches. Uh, he's an incredibly um, godly man that I respect a ton. Uh, he served faithfully in pastoral ministry for around 35 years. Uh, most recently, he was the lead pastor of Salem Alliance Church in Salem, Oregon. Uh, before coming on to serve as our president for the United States uh, branch of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. And uh, we are very privileged to have he and his wife, Joanna, uh, with us this morning. And uh, Dr. Stumbo is going to bring the word for us this morning. So will you welcome up Dr. Stumbo? Thank you, brother. And I want to just pray for you and for our time together. Lord, what a joy to stand here with a dear brother. God, I pray that you would use this man now to awaken in our hearts the greater story that we're tied into, not just as an alliance church, but as Christians, that you are the God of the nations, that one day every tribe, tongue, and nation will declare that you are Lord. Every knee will bow. Oh God, would it be that we would give our very lives and our very heartbeats to be a part of that mission. So God, encourage us, um, convict us, challenge us, remind us of who you are, and uh, would you carry J uh, John Stumbo along as he brings the word to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Thanks Doc. Appreciate you, brother. Good morning, church. It's fun to be here. I have known about, celebrated, and prayed for City Light for all six years of your existence. And, but uh, now to get for the first time to stand in front of you and celebrate this moment, Gavin and Phil and others, I don't take it lightly that I get to be the one to hold the Word of God in my hand and speak to you today. So it's a privilege for me, but thank you. I'm, I'm excited about this moment. And uh, we've heard the scripture reading already today, where it's, it's taken us to Acts 1, 6 through 8. And a question is asked, and it's, it's great to have questions, to ask a question of Jesus. A question is a quest, and, and, and we are to take our questions to Christ, but sometimes our questions reveal how flawed and messed up we really are. 
They had, they, had, they had a good question, they thought. Jesus found three problems in their question, but he was really nice about how he answered. So let's look at the problems, the flaws, the mistakes in their question, even though it was fair to ask the question. So when they gathered together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Three mistakes that they had in that question. Now, what's, what's just happened? What's just happened is that Christ has died He's risen from the dead. He's been meeting with the disciples over a 40-day period of time. This is their last conversation, and they get kind of the chance to ask the big one, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Three mistakes. One was the timing mistake. Lord, are you at this time? What did Jesus say to them? It's not for you to know the times or the seasons. We rarely get an answer to the when question. How, when you've had a crisis in your life, I'm, I'll bet 100 bucks that you ask two questions. Why and how long? <laughs> Why is this going on in my life and how long is this going to last? In fact, Gavin mentioned that uh, we were pastoring in Salem, Oregon and got a couple pictures from that era of time when my wife and I were, uh, had the privilege of serving a sister congregation, yours, Salem Alliance. We were raising our three children, Andrew, Anna, and Josiah. I love being parents of these kids. My daughter got me involved in long-distance running. I became an ultra-marathon runner. Those are races for guys too stupid to stop at 26 miles. And so I just kept going 50K, 60K up and down the mountains of Oregon. Speaking of mountains... This was not my best day. You know, the goal of mountain climbing is not to get to the top. The goal of mountain climbing is get back to your car alive. <laughs> I just about didn't on that day. Fishing has always been a great love, and that was a pretty good day in the Columbia River. I don't show you those pictures to show you a Facebook page. I show you the uh, pictures to establish the fact that I was a really healthy guy in my 40s. But uh, 10 years ago today, oddly enough, Ten years ago today, this is the photo, I was uh, hospitalized with a uh, sudden attack upon my muscular system. I was in a coma for five days. I, um, I was on my deathbed, literally, and some of you that were around in the Alliance family back then prayed for me. Seventy-seven days in the hospital uh, without diagnosis. I was released from the hospital into the care of my wife. Uh, who became my nurse and caregiver. I lost 50 pounds of muscle mass and had to live on a feeding tube. Uh, uh, too far. I uh, had to live on a feeding tube um, for a year and a half. This was breakfast, this was lunch, this was dinner because I had zero capacity to swallow. Now, I didn't know it was a year and a half. I just knew that I couldn't eat. I couldn't drink. I couldn't do anything. We'll, we'll be done with the pictures for a while, brother. But... Um, I, I say all that to you to say, in the, that long period of illness, I was asking the when question. God, will I ever get to lead again? Will I ever get to preach again? Will I ever get to walk again? Will I ever get to eat again? Will I ever get to drink again? Will I, will I ever? Will I ever? And friends, can I just let somebody in the room know who's struggling with a journey of the when? <laughs> My Jesus can do anything at any time for anybody. But sometimes he's got a very specific moment <laughs> that he knows is the best moment for him to reveal himself to you. And meanwhile, behind the scenes, he's at work in deeper ways than maybe you're aware of at the, at the moment. Our marriage would not have been prepared for the level of leadership that now we now have in the Christian Missionary Alliance had it not been for that season of us being confined to our home for a year and a half with her as my caregiver and me in a debilitated state. We all have an interesting story. You have a story as well, and I'm not here to tell my story today. I'm just here on point one to establish a fact. They're asking the when question. We all want to know the when question. When are you going to take care of this? When are you going to come back, Jesus? When are you going to, when are you going to, when are you going to? And we rarely get that answer. Why? Because it throws us into a place of trust. We just got to trust him, <laughs> that he's got a plan, he's, he's got a time, he's, 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 he's got it figured out, but it requires us to trust him. Mistake number two in their question, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Lord, are you at this time? And what does Jesus answer them? 
you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. They're, they're pointing at him. God, what are you going to do? Jesus, what are you going to do? And he turns it around and says, I pretty much did everything I came to do. <laughs> what more do you guys want? You know, I, I left heaven, came into this world, lived a perfect life, died, paid for your sin, I arose from the dead, conquered Satan, conquered death, conquered everything. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And now, what, what, what more do you want? Oh, I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to send you my spirit so that you don't have to go out alone. Never never attempt to reach the world alone. Go go with the power of my spirit. So I'm going to send you my spirit. He's going to come upon you. And But friends, it's not about what I I'm going to do right now. It's about what you're going to do right now. You are going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. There are a lot of people in the world today who are giving the, if there's a God of love, why isn't you doing something about this? <laughs> and I believe that his answer often is, I am doing something about this through my people. As the church arises to live out the gospel, Today, in Chico, California, there's a couple thousand people gathered in the Alliance family, and half of those people in that room, as we gather here, are from paradise. They have no homes. They've lost everything. Friends of mine have fled with their clothes on their back and the car that they jumped in. That's all they've got. Everything's been destroyed. But the church is gathering together, surrounding each other, blessing each other. Tens of thousands of dollars are pouring in, uh, into hundreds of thousands for, for the support of those people as the church comes together. I was, I was in a, a, a meeting one time recently with some scientists. I got invited to this odd meeting uh, uh, with Christian leaders and scientists. And um, it, was, it was this, uh, how do we work together better? And I can't get into all that. But one of the geologists, a female who freely admitted her atheism and was quite pleased and proud of her atheism, but said to me, you know, the one thing that bugs me about you guys is that whenever there's a fire or some sort of crisis in our community, it's always you guys that you, you Christians that show up to help out and to participate and then to help people. It's like, what, what, that just bugged her that she had everything figured out in, in her head, but it was a life example of the church arising to be the church, to be the hands and feet of Jesus that just drove her nuts. And so as people shake their fists at God and say, why aren't you doing something about it? And he says, I've, I've given you my spirit, and I've given you my ability to be my hands and feet and my love and my life. Go into your communities. Go, 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 go. Be the blessing to this world. And so second problem in their question was they thought he was supposed to do everything, and Jesus said, no, it's your turn now. You, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You, you are my hands and feet, my love. Third question, third mistake in their question. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They are not the first ones to think that the whole story was about them. <laughs> they had missed the passage that Gavin referenced earlier and a hundred more throughout the Old Testament that let it be known that it's too small a thing for the plan of God to just be for one people alone, but he wanted to use his work within the people of Israel to be extended as a light to the nations because it's his, always been his heart that there would be representatives in heaven from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. This is the plan of God for this universe. That, that, and the glory of God is too great to be expressed through one culture alone. Will we agree with that? The, heaven would be a really boring place. It was just full of a bunch of Norwegians. Uh, not, <laughs> I'm so glad because every rhythm, every hue, every spice, every nuance, every redeemed part of every culture is, is necessary to more fully reflect the glory of God. And so it's not just about America. It's not just about Israel. It's about every tribe and tongue and language of people. So our Lord, are you this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Uh, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Start right where you are, City Light, Omaha, West Omaha. Start right where you are, but don't get stuck there. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, the surrounding area, the rival sports team. I won't get into that at this moment. <laughs> Just let it go. 
Samaria, people who live close to you who are not like you, Never before in a human history there's been so much Samaria happening all around us. Yesterday's event was joyful with Global Friends. Thank you, City Light, for uh, whoever cooked the Thanksgiving dinner and participated in that. It was amazing. Forty-two nations represented yesterday in your uh, Midtown campus. Uh, amazing. Samaria right among us. You'll be my witnesses, Jesus says, right where you are, Jerusalem, Judea, surrounding area, Samaria, people who live close to you are not like you, and all the way to the ends of the earth. This four-part command and commission and prophecy of our Christ that this is what you're to do and this is what's going to happen. No ors in Acts 1.8. Well, be my witnesses. <coughs> Excuse me. Be my witnesses right where you are or in your region or if you get around and you're really spiritual, reach out to some um, Muslim community that's, that's come to live among you. Or for the spiritually elite, you guys go to Cambodia and take the gospel there. No. It's no ors in Acts 1-8. They're all ands. This is a four-part commission, a four-part prophecy that this is what's going to happen in my in the advancing of the church. So they were to start right where they were, Jerusalem, extend the gospel to Judea, take it to Samaria, all the way to the ends of the earth. City light, way to go and reach in your Jerusalem and your Judea and your Samaria. I, just, I, I, I see examples of it all over with your church planning. I mean, you're even reaching to Kansas City, right? Uh, and that's, that's a pretty broad Judea kind of thing. Fantastic. It's cool. I celebrate it. And as Gavin said, I'm, I'm here to invite us to greater participation into the ends of the earth aspect of that four-part commission. So how did they do? Uh, those early disciples. Jesus said, you're going to be my witnesses right where you are, your region, Samaria, ends of the earth. How did they do? That was Acts chapter 1. They got the command. When chapter 2, they're still in Jerusalem. Chapter 3, they're still in Jerusalem. Chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, they're still in Jerusalem. They stayed in Jerusalem all the way until chapter 8 when a persecution broke out. And then opposition became the opportunity for them to finally get out of town. So, they got off to a slow start, actually, in reaching the ends of the earth. And I'm sad to say that 2,000 years later, there are still, please hear this, thousands of languages and millions of communities and billions of people that still do not have any idea about the message that we gather around today. No clue and no access let me tell you a couple stories about that and, and one quick statistic. Um, one story. Uh, not long ago in the Middle East, uh, one of our missionaries had a single copy of the Bible sitting on her dining room table, and uh, women came for this secret Bible study, fully garbed, came sneaking into the house. It couldn't be known that they were studying the Bible. But one of the women interrupted and said, you're just learning Arabic. I don't want to embarrass you. I don't think you realize what you just said. But you just told us that we could be forgiven of everything that we've ever done. Certainly I misunderstood you because that's impossible. No, our missionary said, I, I didn't make a language mistake. I, uh, that's what I'm trying to say because that's what the gospel says. You can be forgiven. Friends, we feel like this is a justice issue that you can still live in the world today and not have access to that information. Here's how it looks like mathematically for the four people in the room that like math. If, um, if you were to knock on a door here in the United States looking to find a follower of Jesus and you knocked on a door every 15 minutes, within an hour and a half, statistically it would vary from one part of the country to another, but within an hour and a half you could find a follower of Christ. If you want to find a follower of Jesus in Europe, let's say, you'd have to knock on a door every 15 minutes for eight hours a day for a day and a half before you'd find your first follower of Christ in Germany or Spain. But I'm talking about places in the world that don't have access to this message, that, that, that don't have a Bible yet, don't have churches yet. Places like some of the Middle East, some of North Africa, some of the former Soviet Union, those Stan countries. If you wanted to find a follower of Jesus there and you knocked on a door every 15 minutes, you'd have to knock for eight hours a day for 365 days a year. No days off. For two and a half years before you'd find your first follower of Christ. Start today and sometime in 2021, you'd meet your very first Christian. I'm sad 
and I'm excited at the same time. <laughs> I'm sad because 2,000 years after Christ, there's still a major portion of this planet that doesn't have access to this book, doesn't have a gathering like this to celebrate, and doesn't have awareness that they can be forgiven of everything they've ever done. That's the sad part. The glad part is you're part of a family that's actually doing something about it. And that's the, we've got this long history of engaging in what it means to take this message to the world. And we're making great progress in these days. And so let me take you on the fastest world tour that you've ever been on. I'm gonna, we're going to switch to the screen with this world tour. And what we're going to do is walk you through uh, the history of... Um, uh, the family that you're a part of, starting right here in North America, this pastor named Simpson uh, resigned from his congregation because they wouldn't allow new immigrants into his church. Interesting. 1880s, similar issues happening. Um, the, uh, they, they, were, they were determined to take the gospel to the, starting right where they were, which was New York City. The first thing he did was to launch a magazine, which is still available for a free subscription in the back of the room. But um, the second thing he did was launch a local church, which exists today as 2,000 churches that City Light is part of, including three deaf congregations uh, using ASL for their congregation. Uh, those churches together in the last 10 years have baptized, that's just Ohio State Stadium. We don't care about that. We've baptized 122,000 people in the, last, in the last years together as the Alliance family. They started a missionary training institute. How do you become a missionary in the late 1800s? Well, he started the first school for that, uh, uh, for that to emerge that now exists as four colleges around the United States. They sent their very first missionary to Africa, uh, to the country of that we call Congo. And John Condit was a 20-year-old team leader to be our very first missionary sent out and he died within two weeks of his arrival. He lasted two weeks. The team got discouraged. Only one member of the team remained. Yet today, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, there's a million followers of Jesus in the Alliance family, 2.3 million throughout sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the fruit of that early martyr. Guinea is one of those countries where we helped curb the Ebola crisis and came along to mourn with those who mourn. We have a hospital in Gabon in a very underdeveloped area of that country, in the Bongalo Hospital, sh shares the message of Jesus to every patient and family member that comes to that hospital. And in just the last two years, over 3,000 people have come to faith through the Bangalore Hospital. Burkina Faso, one of the poorest uh, countries on the planet, clean water is an issue there. So our teams have come to help dig wells on church properties so the local community can come to the church and get uh, clean water. Uh, widows are often rejected uh, by their families if they embrace Jesus as their Savior. And so we come alongside widows and there's a section of Burkina Faso that has rejected any entrance of missionaries or the church for decades, wanted nothing to do with Christianity. But in just the last few years, the door has opened wide open, and now we have 50 church plants happening in this region that for decades was resistant to the gospel. Mali, the neighboring country, uh, we've launched a women and children's hospital there with, that now celebrates their 10-year anniversary, and they've now treated 100,000 patients, delivered 20,000 babies, conducted a whole bunch of surgeries, and if you look closely at the, that picture, it might be hard to see, but the very first child born at that hospital is a little girl in that picture. So we celebrate. We rejoice with those who rejoice. Cote d'Ivoire, former Ivory Coast, 3,000 churches larger than the U.S. Christian Missionary Alliance. And uh, they recently had a women's conference where 6,000 women came for this conference and took an offering of $3,000 for the persecuted Christians in the Middle East. 
Let's jump continents. Let's go over to Asia Pacific. Uh, in in um, our early days of entrance there, it was a man named Robert Jaffrey who walked away from a family fortune. Uh, his parents owned the largest newspaper chain of all of Canada, and he walked away from the family fortune to help us launch missionary movements throughout uh, Asia, including countries you now called Vietnam and China and Indonesia. Even during the Great Depression, when uh, there was a uh, uh, press to stop sending missionaries and to pull back, Jaffrey said, do you ask and view the terrible economic depression of today, dare we go forward in these new fields and commence new work? Yea, rather, may we ask this, dare we? In the face of the command of the Lord Jesus, and in the face of the encouraging miracles he's working on our behalf, dare we hesitate for one moment. And so we move forward in places like Vietnam, where the 1968 uh, Tet Offensive resulted in seven deaths as our missionaries were killed in the midst of those skirmishes. They tried to stay as long as possible to keep bringing the gospel to the Vietnamese people. Yet today, there's over a million believers worshiping Christ um, throughout the Alliance churches of Vietnam. The communists confiscated our seminary property and closed it down for decades, but recently they have allowed uh, a, a rebuilding of the seminary. Gave us back only one-tenth of the land, so if you can't build wide, <laughs> city light, build high. Uh, uh, so that's our seminary there as uh, new waves of, of kingdom servants are rising up to take the gospel. Philippines, what a fabulous country. It was college students living in outlying areas who asked the Alliance, would you plant an Alliance church in the capital city where we're going to university? And so the capital city Alliance church was founded. That church alone uh, is, is a few years ahead of City Light. So here's a challenge for you, Gavin. That church alone now, 35 church plants from, from that uh, church in Manila, including this this one in a squatter's community, an informal settlement. settlement. And uh, this one, bonus points if you find the Alliance Church in that picture. Uh, it's, it's up there on the second floor. So tucked away in all these places, the church is emerging and arising and a beautiful expression of the Filipino Christian Missionary Alliance. Your brothers there are, and sisters are joyful. And this is the team of missionaries that our Filipino churches are sending often to places where we as American citizens can't go. Indonesia, a lovely country, lovely people, uh, hundreds of languages that don't yet have access to the gospel. And so this gentleman uh, moved into a community that has uh, no churches, no known believers, and started a coffee shop uh, that actually uses uh, cop, uh, the Luwak coffee, the animals are required in the production of this coffee. Okay. Anyway, if you don't know about it, don't worry about it. But uh, he's using that form of coffee uh, as an outreach to the community. It's very effective. A church has been planted. People have, are coming to faith in Christ. Cambodia, I know some people in the room know a few things about Cambodia as the, uh, their goal is to take the gospel to every village in Cambodia within the next few years. Uh, there's joyful baptisms taking place. A new translation of the Bible has come out for a language that before did not have it. And our teams from home to home and community to community are, are, are extending the reach of the gospel in Cambodia. Laos. It was the Andrianoffs that first brought the gospel to Laos. They lived in the most isolated missionary outpost of all of Indochina. They'd only see their missionary colleagues once a year. It was a shaman who was the first to come to faith in Christ. He helped them translate the Bible into the Hmong language. And today there's literally hundreds of thousands of Hmong believers throughout uh, Asia and right here in the United States. Uh, powerful work of God among the Hmong. Japan. Um, our, our missionaries uh, on our national office didn't listen to Jaffrey and withdrew from Japan during the Great Depression. But Mabel Francis, one of our missionaries, respectfully resigned from the mission and stayed in country, was there to welcome us back when we returned and received the highest civilian award at age 83 that can be conferred by the Japanese government for a lifetime of faithful service. 
Yet today, still less than one half of 1% of Japanese are followers of Christ, one of the most resistant regions of Asia. Yet this university student, the guy with the long hair, literally found a Bible in a Tokyo gutter, found, his alliance, found the Alliance Church because it was close to his favorite pizza place. Maybe that's a strategy for you here. I'm not sure. And found Christ in that church and today is studying for ministry because of the impact of Christ in his life. Middle East. Let's jump to the Middle East where they, it was the Braden family that first brought the gospel there. George would travel by camel from Jerusalem to Amman to Beirut, got arrested along the way numerous times. Yet today, Baghdad, Jesus is the light of the world, that sign says at the top of that building as Pastor Joseph survived a car bomb and, and uh, leads the gospel and leads that church with great joy and effectiveness. Jordan, uh, where picture a church of 50 people praying, Lord, how do we reach more people for Christ when the Syrian civil war breaks out? And today they have this large community center with outreach to thousands of Syrian refugees, including a school for 180 Syrian refugee children. Powerful expression of the gospel for one of, from one of your sister churches in Jordan including uh, also in Jordan, a uh, school. If you're a Muslim family that has a disabled child, it's unlikely you'll get any education for that child. So we've come in with this Christian school and uh, with local leadership and is uh, providing hope uh, for those families. Meanwhile, in Jordan, other expressions of the body of Christ, one local church runs this clinic for other refugees that have come in, and we come alongside to just assist people that uh, have had to flee for their lives and um, start all over again in a place that's not their own. A little closer to home, our Spanish and Portuguese-speaking neighbors to the south. It was through the river routes that we first brought the gospel to Latin America. And Peru today uh, celebrates uh, 300 churches, sending out 60 workers. We have Chinese work going on in Peru because of the Chinese uh, uh, communities all across the world. And no ministry is complete without a ping-pong table, right? My peer, President Mario Rojas, recently came to my office in Colorado Springs and gave me this gift. It's the original ultramarathon runners, the Chaskis, that would take the message of the Inca Empire to the people. He didn't know I had been a runner. He just brought me the gift and said it was the, it was the alliance that first brought the gospel to our people. Thank you. I challenge you to continue to be a herald of the gospel to the world. So... It's one of my favorite things in my office. You can suffer for Jesus if you'd like, down in Dominican Republic. We've got dozens of churches down there, including a church plant in Punta Cana. And did you know that we have sister churches in Cuba? During the decades when the U.S. was not welcome in Cuba, our Canadian and Peruvian brothers and sisters were able to get into Cuba. And now there's 70 churches strong. And if you don't have rhythm before you go there, you're going to have it by the time you get back. This is my peer, the president of the Cuban Christian Missionary Alliance, Yoel, who's got a powerful testimony coming out of Castro atheism and um, embracing Christ. Latin America region all told, there's uh, 3,700 students in preparation to take the gospel to the world. Europe. Some people think the church in Europe is dead. We would beg to differ. Baptisms in Italy, church planting going on in Germany, including Spanish speakers living in Germany, a good work of God there, uh, and ministry to the Syrian refugees. You know that Sy uh, Germany opened up their doors to refugees, and so we've got impact on the, with the Syrian refugees as well. France. If you ever want to experience Paris in, in a way that no tourist ever gets to experience it, we have our Genesis Center. That's a place for the community to gather, to learn English, to, to experience uh, something beyond just the secular culture. Um, <clears throat> international churches, three international churches, baptisms taking place, the kingdom of God advancing, and Kosovo is a fascinating story where this liberation fighter fought to free his country, was angry that that freedom was now being used by terrorists to recruit terrorist fighters, and so he walked away from Islam and sought after a pastor, had to travel a couple hundred kilometers 
to find a pastor, but brought him to his community. And now there is a brand new expression of the church arising in a place where the church has not before existed with dozens of baptisms taking place. And this is a, a sweet new expression of the church. Physical, or excuse me, occupational therapy did not exist in Kosovo before our team introduced it to the university system. I got to keep moving. Uh, North Central Asia, Russia, when the Soviet Union fell, we sent in a group of of, uh, a strong leadership team that now partnered with the Russian national churches. And there's 100 churches strong in Russia that are sister churches to yours. You couldn't find six believers in Mongolia 30 years ago, but today we have 30 church plants there. And you might be aware there's places in the world that are just so politically sensitive, we have to sneak people in, and we can't say their country names in public, but a place we call Tea House, for the first time in history, there's people coming to faith in Christ, baptisms on a place in North Africa we call Long Beach. But if you're a Bible study student, like the author of Hebrews 11, he says, I do not have, I do not have time to tell of, well, I don't have time to tell of Angola, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, El Salvador, Ghana, Great Britain, Guatemala, Haiti, Honduras, India, Israel, Kenya, Lebanon, Myanmar, Mexico, Nepal, Niger, Panama, or Portugal, South Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, Venezuela, more than a dozen closed access countries, or Fiji, Finland, New Zealand, Australia. And let's sing it together. Oh, Canada. Okay. All told, your alliance family, this family that you're part of, number 6.3 million people in 180 languages and 22,000 churches. And all that started because a guy resigned from his church over the immigration issue. <laughs> I, <laughs> so two things as I wrap. Two things. One, I'm not asking you to join something new or do something different. I'm, I'm telling you, these are your stories. This is what you're already part of. When you join the Alliance family, this is the storyline that you entered into. So this isn't like something new or different or uh, now, now City Light's doing what? No, no, no. This is who City Light is. This is what you are a part of. These are your stories. This is what you can celebrate. This is what you're part of. And the fun thing is that one single gift supports all the stories. You, you can segment if you want, if you, if you care about just giving to a certain place. We can do that. But what we do, we make it simpler, and one gift supports the whole thing. And so um, I wanted to tell you that these are already your stories. Lastly, I want to come back to Acts 1 and remind you that Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. The advancing of the kingdom of God in this world is not just through a couple of super leaders. You've got great leaders here at City Light, but it was never the plan of God for the kingdom to advance through a couple of people with a microphone. It's always been the plan of God for the kingdom to advance through all of us. All of us have a part. All of us have a place to play. So one last story. I was in the Philippines um, in that auditorium that you may remember seeing with all those missionaries being sent out. And I was speaking for a, a, a conference multiple times, and they asked me if I would give a presentation that required me to use like 16 photos and a video. And so I got there for that service. It was the last service of the whole conference, and the screens were black. There was nothing on the screens. And it wasn't one of those kind of screens where there's a projection unit shining on the screen. It was those jumbotron kind of screens that all had to be lit up by themselves, and they were large enough, both of them, for an auditorium of 4,000 people. So they were big. And I got there, and they were black. And I tried to not be the impatient American, so I just, you know, tried to chill for a minute. But the song leader, the worship leader came up and had to do the say a line, sing a line, say a line, sing a line, because there weren't any lyrics on the screen. And so I started to get worried, and I said to the tech guy, what's going on? He said, no electricity. Well, I don't know what no electricity means in Manila, but I don't think it's a very good thing. So, so I prayed with my eyes open, and the screen just had some flashes of digital nonsense, and then it went black again. I was sitting next to a friend of mine who was uh, into spiritual warfare kind of prayer, and uh, I said, hey, Don, I need those screens. you got to pray. And he does this. I got my eyes open. The whole screen lights up with digital nonsense and then goes black again. 
Now I'm up there preaching. It's time. And black, 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 I'm distracted. Finally, I just stopped and said, friends, you've noticed that these screens haven't worked today. I really need them for the rest of my presentation. Would you just pray? And a thousand prayer huddles broke into session just for two or three minutes. I wish I had my, clock, my stopwatch on, but within four minutes or less, those screens lit up, worked perfectly, and never glitched again the entire service. Now, why do I tell you that story? Well, one reason is you got a one-flicker president. Never mind. We'll come back to that later. <laughs> the, the real reason I tell you the story is they're still telling the story. I, I, I was here in the United States uh, just recently, and a Filipino came running up to me after the service and said, hey, do you remember that time you were in Manila? Oh, I remember. Do you remember when, when the screens didn't work? Oh, yeah, I remember that really well. And then we all prayed, and then, then the, the screen, screens worked perfectly. Do you remember that? They're still telling the story because it's their story. If God had answered my prayers, I would have had a story to tell. If God had answered Donna my prayers, we would have had a story to tell. But since everybody was involved, it became everybody's story. Friends, this is the way the gospel advances is when we all find where we have our part, where we get to be involved. Because Acts 1.8, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's supposed to be everybody's story. No Christian should go out without the power of the Holy Spirit. And you will be my witnesses. That's supposed to be everybody's story. You have a story to tell. You have something to testify to of how good God is. And that's supposed to happen in your town, your region, your Samaria, and all the way to the ends of the earth. Not all of us do all of those equally as much, but all of us are called to have a part. So, Gavin, come on back up here. Thank you for this privilege to speak to you today. God bless you all. Dr. Stumball, what a joy to have you. Thanks for bringing the Word of God and just sharing your passion for the nations. And uh, what a joy to be a part of the Alliance family. Amen. Uh, I had the privilege of being in Cambodia with one of our elders, Jack Arendt, and my son, Grady, and one of our church planners in Lincoln, Austin Edwards. And what struck me is just the strategic nature. We don't send uh, missionaries just to anywhere in the world. Uh, the vision of the Alliance is to go to the least reached and the unreached. And uh, I was just struck by um, the strategic design of our sending. And so we go through five stages. We start by pioneering. We go into countries that have no gospel access, and we evangelize. We pioneer that mission field. Then we go into parenting, where we train up uh, church leaders and sort of coach them on how to uh, minister the gospel. And then we go to partner. We want to hand away leadership to the local people. And then we go into participants, where uh, or partnership. And then we go into participants, where we sit under their leadership. And then uh, I want to add another P, which is not in the Alliance Strategy book, but it's peace out, because that's what we do. As soon as the gospel has taken root in a region and there's indigenous leadership, we move on uh, into unreached regions. And so uh, just one of the many reasons I'm proud to be a part of this church family. And uh, so thank you so much for your leadership, John. At the very end, I'm going to give just a few practical ways that we can respond. Uh, but in a moment like this, I just want to draw our hearts back to Jesus Christ. Because before he ever sent us anywhere, he was the first and ultimate missionary. Amen? Jesus Christ had the comforts of his heavenly home, perfectly content with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, and yet for the sake of the mission, he was sent out as a missionary to come into the creation that he had created to bring redemption to all of mankind. So we're going we're to respond first this morning by remembering the ultimate missionary, Jesus Christ, by taking communion. So communion service, if you would grab the elements, and I would just remind you of our instructions. It says in 1 Corinthians that our Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, uh, took bread. And when he had give, given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, after supper, he took the cup and gave it to them, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. He says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so before Jesus ever sent you, he was sent for you. You were on the receiving end of the mission God before we are ever sent out on his mission. And so let's take a moment and remember the good news of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are welcome to the Lord's table. This is a meal of commembrance and a celebration. If you're not a follower of Jesus, this meal isn't for you. We ask that you would abstain. The Bible says that we are to take this uh, in a worthy manner, examining our hearts, not taking it lightly uh, as we remember the Lord's death. There will be stations in the front and in the back. 
Uh, and there will be a gluten-free station in the back, as well as a team that would love to pray with and for you during this time of ministry. So would you stand to your feet right now? Uh, let me pray. Uh, there's no usher, so you guys come forward to take the meal whenever you're ready. Jesus, we are struck uh, by the work of your people, men and women of God who have literally laid down their lives, much as Jesus laid down his life for us. And they laid him down that your gospel, your name and fame, your kingdom would extend into every tribe, nation, and tongue on this earth. God, it's our joy to be a part of that. And in this moment, would you just remind us of the great cost of your missionary work on our behalf, your body and your blood given for us. Minister to us now as we remember you through this meal in Jesus' name. Amen.